Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this informative Zoom seminar that we have on this glorious rainy day outside in our lovely state. Uh, for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Chris Caulfield. I am the event director for the Waterbury Regional Chamber. And today we are going to bring you, we are welcoming you to navigating the new business landscape, cybersecurity and identity theft after 2020. We are joined today by Justin Golden of Golden Technology Services and Delano Paul of Legal Shield Live from the Waterbury Regional Chamber Boardroom. We're also joined by Bill Becker of B Squared Intel via Zoom. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter it in the chat below and the panel will answer the questions once their presentation is over. Now I'd like to turn it over to Bill Becker from B Squared Intel. So sit back and enjoy this informative seminar. Take it away, Bill. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining our seminar. Uh, just a little bit about who I am and what I do. Uh, my, my core competency is uh, pretty much public reconnaissance. So on the cybersecurity side of things, when I'm working with a, a, a business client, I'm actually taking the first steps a bad actor does and looking for weaknesses and vulnerabilities within an organization's website or, uh, or anything that can spill over to like social media and any, anywhere else that things can be published that could lead to a cybersecurity incident or be uh, turned towards uh, that company, company that can uh, tarnish their the goodwill and reputation that they've worked so hard to build. So that's a little bit about what I do. And uh, Terry, if, uh, next slide, please. So just a disclaimer, I am not an attorney. So what I'm presenting to you today is just a reiteration of what uh, this uh, Connecticut cybersecurity law is going to uh, state. So if you do have any legal questions, uh, uh, please consult uh, an attorney that you do trust. Uh, if you do need help with, uh, with connecting with somebody that uh, uh, can help you answer these questions, I do have um, a contact for a, uh, an attorney that specializes in uh, cybersecurity and data privacy law. So please use me as a resource for that. Uh, so next slide, please. So 2020 is certainly a year that a lot of us want to forget and you know, people have struggled in, in very in different ways and in varying degrees. When we're looking at uh, cybersecurity itself, uh, I'm gonna say like maybe the end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter, cybercrime just like ramped up and has just gone absolutely wild. Uh, some of the, the statistics that have uh, kind of like took me by surprise, uh, especially the first one is 80% of uh, cybersecurity data breaches are caused by uh, external threat actors. That was from Verizon's uh, data breach investigations report for both 2020 and 2021. Uh, the trend is still uh, is still that way, and that kind of flipped the tr traditional threat model on its head. Where traditionally, roughly 80% come from in internal sources that could be employees, vendors, contractors, but you know, the landscape has changed. And the driving factor of this is these threat actors know that your organization has valuable data. So for them, it's a financial incentive, whether they're launching a ransomware attack or they're stealing the data and selling it for a profit. Uh, and it, they don't care about the size of the organization too, whether you're a small business or you're a very large organization. When it comes to victim losses, the FBI has showed uh, or you know, through the criminal complaints that have been filed uh, across the United States, losses are roughly $4.2 billion. And if we look locally, Connecticut, that's roughly $41 million of victim losses. So there is a, certainly financial impact with a lot of uh, with businesses. And some of these incidents could be business ending depending on like how severe it is. So something certainly needs to like move in the right direction. Next slide, please. So, yeah, I, in, yeah, man, on some connection issues. Sorry about that. <laughs> so in July, 
of this year, uh, Governor Lamont signed uh, a cybersecurity bill into law, and it's now in effect as of October 1st of this year. Uh, it's Public Act Number 21-119, an act incentivizing the adoption of cybersecurity standards for businesses. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to have everybody do at some point is to read the law and understand to the best of your ability that'll define like who, who is considered a business and then uh, other pertinent information uh, that may affect uh, how you proceed with this law. So in a very broad stroke, this law is going to affect both for-profit and nonprofit organizations. And if we look at business structure, it's going to range from everything from sole proprietorship to a corporation. Next slide, please. So once you figure out that, you know, if that you're a business doing business in Connecticut, the next thing you have to figure out is, are you considered a covered entity? And the law is defining a covered entity as a business that is interacting with sensitive information in some way, shape or form, and they're calling this personal or restricted information and restricted information. Uh, and you're doing so using one or more computer systems or services, to probably define it, located in or outside of the state of Connecticut. Next slide, please. What the defining moment for you is going to be is the type of uh, information or data that you're going to, um, that you're dealing with. And that comes to personal and restricted information. So the law is defining personal information as information that contains somebody's full name or first initial last name in combination with, and they have various examples of uh, what they're considering you know, sensitive data. So for example, in this slide, we have a social security number. On the other side of the coin, we have restricted information. And the law is defining this as any non-public information that can either directly identify somebody, or if there's enough of it, it could be traced and linked back to an individual. And unfortunately, the law isn't giving you any concrete examples, but one thing I can think of is an account number. And if we look into this uh, center of these intersecting circles, a, a couple of entities that might, you know, as examples that would deal with this type of information would be uh, an insurance agency, a CPA, a law firm, uh, certainly healthcare providers. So there's gonna be a lot of people that are, are going to have to, you know, work on uh, sussing out what kind of information they have and if they have to start protecting it. Next slide, please. So what I believe the intention of this law is, I want you to think of it as a seatbelt for your business. Uh, because we know that seatbelts save lives and the intention is for you to survive some sort of uh, collision with another vehicle uh, or an object for that matter. And if a cybersecurity attack slams into your organization, you want to be best prepared to you know, have a survivable incident. Um, so I'm probably gonna steal uh, some of Justin's thunder who's gonna be speaking next, but roughly, 60% uh, of small and medium-sized businesses go out of business within six months of a cybersecurity incident. So there has to be something uh, to kind of help stem, you know, stem this loss. So I think, I, I believe this law is a step in the right direction. There's, it's not a silver bullet. There's nothing, no, no thing is 100% secure. However, if, if you are considered a covered entity, the incentive of this law is if your organization experiences a data breach and you are sued in civil court, if you're able to demonstrate that you have uh, taken uh, preventative measures to protect the data that you're responsible for and that, uh, that you're able to show that you've adopted created, maintained, and complied with a reputable cybersecurity framework and have stayed up to date within six months of, of publication of those changes, then what the state is going to do is shield that organization 
uh, from any punitive, dam punitive damages resulting from that uh, from that data breach. And this is a moment that I'm going to say, you know, this is where you, you certainly will have to turn to your attorney to understand you know, what that looks like for you should something happen. Next slide, please. So my goals for everybody here today are, you know, if we're going to set some goals, by next Tuesday, read the law and understand it to, to the best of your ability, and then work on determining if you are considered a covered entity. So that means just going through all the data that you, that you store, that you process, that you have access to, or that you transmit between uh, certain you know, other platforms to kind of like categorize, okay, so this is sensitive data versus everything I do has no, no bearing on this. So, uh, so after, if you decided that, you know, you do fall into the covered entity category, then starting next week after November 2nd is to start selecting uh, a reputable cybersecurity framework. The law itself does list out a, a list of what, uh, of different frameworks that they consider reputable, and once you uh, once you narrow that down to the one that best suits your needs, or if you are in an industry that is regulated by a federal law or state law or regulation, you're you would are, you're going to be adhering to that. So if you are a healthcare provider, it will be HIPAA high tech, or if you're doing payment processing, it's going to be PCI. Um, so you're going to work within those guidelines. Um, one thing I do want to mention is this is a, uh, a process that you're not going to bang out in a day. Um, so plan accordingly, depending on the size and complexity of your organization. It could take weeks, it could take months, or hopefully no less than a year. But there's going to be a time investment in it. And this is going to shift how your you know, organization is run. So next slide, please. That's pretty much it for me. What I'll, what I'll do during the Q&A is uh, drop a link to the law itself in the chat so that everybody can grab it. Or if you need to uh, use my contact information, certainly reach out to me and we can have a conversation too about the various ways B-Squared Intel can help your organization. But as of now, what I'm going to do is turn things over to Justin Golden of Golden Technology Services. Justin is going to be uh, discussing and, and touching upon uh, cybersecurity awareness training and education. And within relation to the law itself, these cybersecurity frameworks do call out this type of training. So uh, Justin's going to be another valuable source for you. So without further ado, uh, take it away, Justin. Sorry, folks, we seem to be having a little technical difficulty. Please uh, hang on with us for a moment. Um, Wombat, which is a cybersecurity firm, reports that with regular quarterly cybersecurity awareness, you can reduce the likelihood of a successful attack by 90%. Next slide, please. Let's talk about uh, the top three cybersecurity threats. And this varies year to year, but right now it's a type of phishing. Phishing is electronically when someone tries to convince you via email, text, and even voicemail to do something. Open a link, cl click on an attachment, or provide sensitive information, usually with a false sense of security. Um, to reveal that information to them. Ransomware is when they encrypt the data on your computer, your network, and they make it unavailable, unavailable until a ransom is paid, usually by a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Malware or malicious software is when they capture your banking credentials 
wiping your bank account clean or transferring money. Um, it's also uh, a method of them for stealing your identity uh, for, for bad purposes. Next slide, please. The impact of a breach. A recent survey said, uh, this is SMB, small, medium-sized business customers. 22% uh, of them reported losing customers, meaning someone who finds out about a, a breach, whether in the newspaper, on the radio, or television, uh, will no longer do business with you. 23% uh, represent lost opportunities. So you may have been working on a prospect or a suspect for a while, and you're close to closing some business. And then almost a third re represented significant lost revenue as a result of this, this data breach being revealed. Next slide, please. Here's some sobering statistics. Um, the FBI reports that uh, um, internet crime, the most common one, over 50% is phishing. So since 2020, since the pandemic began, um, the, the crimes that are being reported to the FBI are, uh, the majority are phishing attempts, successful or just attempts. 60% um, of small, medium-sized businesses are forced out of business within six months of a data breach. 93% uh, malware or malicious software is delivered via email. 77% of cyber crimes target small, medium-sized businesses. And the average cost of a cyber attack for a small, medium-sized business is over $2 million. Next slide, please. The drivers and target, who needs it most? So uh, they target HR managers, IT directors, the business owner, uh, compliance officer, chief information security officer, chief information officer, and your existing relationships. And what are the targets? Well, the bad news is that they target every industry. Uh, right now, the top industries that are being hacked successfully, not saying attempted, but hacked successfully are healthcare, financial services, um, law enforcement, legal, retail, manufacturing, SMB. And these industries vary year to year. Uh, a lot of times people wonder, well, they're only after my money. Well, they're after getting into your corporation, your company, a single proprietary, whatever it is, and stealing information and then using that to monetize in some shape or form. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Um, education is the best way in which you can reduce these uh, attempted hacks or hacking from occurring um, on a regular basis. And again, since the threat landscape and the bad actors continually evolve, as we can all see, and have read recently, um, you need to educate yourself and your employees. And then also you need to test them to make sure they're using their best practices while they're online. I'm gonna talk about two offerings here that do both of those. One's called WorkWise. It's online cybersecurity training and education uh, not built on nine topics. And the, the reason for this is to, to increase employee awareness of cybersecurity, what's going on and, and how to prevent successful hacking from occurring. And then secondly, there's an email phishing solution called OneFish, where you can target divisions, departments, employees with emails, make it look like it's an internal or external email and see what they do. The most important thing is that they report it to you or to someone in your company is responsible for that. Do they click on the link? Do they download the attachment or do they actually provide sensitive information? Next slide, please. Next. So WorkWise is nine modules, and I'll go into the, the different modules in a moment here. Uh, it takes about less than two hours to complete if you sit down and do it at, in one shot. Um, it's a way of monitoring your employees' progress. So in other words, you could say, we need everyone to complete this education by a certain date, um, and then track that to make sure that everyone's making progress and ultimately finishing and, and completing it. It's self-paced, so you do it at your own pace, and you can start and stop when time allows. It's cloud hosted, so it's very secure and then verifiable. So after each module, you're given five questions to ensure that you're following along and have learned what was discussed in that individual module. And then at the, when you finish all nine modules, you're given a 25 question final examination and provided a numeric score with 75 or higher, a passing score and provided a certificate of completion electronically that you can forward on to the appropriate contact in your business. Next slide, please. Here, here are the topics, and these topics content is updated every year with the latest and greatest. So information security one-on-one, -on -one. so the basic 
blocking and tackling every employee needs to be aware of uh, passwords. And now they're using passphrases. So how to set one, when to change them, et cetera. Connectivity, uh, when you're connected, whether in your home office, in the, in the actual physical office and traveling, how to access and send and receive information safely. Devices, we're all using smartphones, laptops, tablets, and fill in the blank other devices as well. So how to use them and how to use them safely. Social engineering, most of us use social media platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, um, and tells you about how people get certain information about you individually or your company, and they, then they try to use that against you to make you do things, provide information, or again, click on links, downloads, attachments, et cetera. Malicious attacks, there's a history of recent malicious attacks that happen across the United States. Incident reporting, how you report an incident and document it, because in some industries, you're required to report that to the state and federal government, and then insider threat. Next slide, please. Next slide. So phishing. The email phishing simulator has 40 plus industry templates. And what I mean is if you're in healthcare uh, and you're trying to fish your employees to see who's responding to a, uh, a simulation, you don't wanna use manufacturing logo and jargon. You wanna use something that's relative to the industry you're in. So it has 40 plus templates. Uh, you can send out as many tests as you want. Uh, you can send them out at a regular time, end of the month, end of the quarter, end of the year. Uh, you can send it to different departments within an organization. And then you can uh, establish a baseline for your employees. So who needs to improve? Who's doing very well? And then sometimes people will then use this to establish the baseline and then educate their employees. And they go back a week, a month later after people have completed it and then test them again or test them on a regular basis to make sure that people are following the best practices. If not, then obviously they have a counseling session and worse, if, if that, then they may have to uh, move on, so to speak, from their job. It provides high-level company reports and detailed employee actions. I'll turn this over. Batting cleanup here is Delano Paul from ID and Legal Shield. Delano. All right. Thank you very much, Justin. Just a, a pleasure to uh, talk to you guys today and just uh, really go through some information. So I've been a trusted advisor with Legal Shield for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, it's been a true joy just be able to work and really be a blessing to individuals and really help them out in terms of everything that's going on. And so I'm going to be, uh, as Justin said, I'm the pinch hitter, the one that brings it home. Uh, so uh, let the first first thing I want to jump into is just the thing is just having an opportunity to show my family. So I just want to show the gang and uh, what's going on with them, just to give you an idea of it. So that's the gang right there, uh, the individuals that why I do what I do and, and the individuals that keep me motivated every day in terms of just helping uh, with identity theft and just protecting against that. So I'm gonna make you uh, two promises. Promise number one is that I promise that uh, you're not gonna fall asleep like this guy right here during my presentation. Uh, so that's my first promise. My second promise and my hope is that the information that I, I share with you, uh, I'll give you outer world you know, space uh, experience so that you'll be just like blown away by it and just are uh, tremendously grateful for it. So that's my, that's the two promises. That's the two things that I hope that I, I go through in terms of everything else. And so the thing about it is this, right? There's, there's two, there's two U's. So there's the database U and there's the U, the physical U, right? And it's kind of hard to prove that you are not you, even though you know you're you, right? That's confusing just in its essence, but it's a situation with identity theft what you're trying to prove is you're trying to prove that the person, the uh, database you, the one that's online is not you. Uh, so all the information and everything that's happened there, are you trying to prove that that's not the person that actually did it? And, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult uh, situation to really get around and be able to take care of. And because our information is in all these different databases. And so even though we might be safe with our information, other people are not that safe with our information. Uh, so the situation where uh, you uh, you might be really good in terms of all the different password protections, all the different things that you put in place, uh, but the individuals that have your information, like uh, the uh, like for instance the 
the drivers, uh, authorities, they, they've been hacked a, a few dozen times. There's, there's the healthcare, the people that we do uh, have our insurances with and those things. And they might not be taking as good care without information as we are taking care in terms of our information. Uh, so we want to make sure that we have some sort of thing in place that uh, monitors and really make sure that our information and the different things that we have is, is, is really protected in regards to that. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're doing this. And so when normally we think of identity theft, we think of just the financial arena. We just think of our credit cards that, you know, our banks uh, protect that and, and, and by law, they, they have up to, you have up to 60 days if you have a financial identity theft uh, to report it and they'll give you back your entire money. Uh, but we're talking about the other areas of identity theft that we don't even think about. Uh, for instance, there's driver's license identity theft. Uh, so there's a situation where the DMV on uh, Norwalk and, 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 and uh, had a situation where the individuals are selling our information with other people's pictures of it, right? There's also social security. They had this, uh, this big article where this woman uh, went for a job at Target and they said, ma'am, uh, we're sorry, you can't, we can't hire you because apparently you already work here. There were 37 people working under one social security reporting taxes under her name. Now the IRS know that you can't have 37 jobs, but guess what the IRS wants? They want the money from the 37 jobs that you have. And so those are some of the situations. The medical identity theft has been one of the biggest ones uh, lately just because of medical coverage and just all those different things that's going on with that. And it's the one that potentially could, could kill you. So it's a situation where if the wrong medical information or the wrong prescription is done, then it has a situation where it could be uh, seriously lethal and detrimental in terms of uh, so. so you wanna make sure that those things is also character criminal. The financial identity of the one that we worry about all the time that we keep thinking about is less than 30% of all identity thefts out there. So there's all these different things. And what's going on, the two biggest ones that are coming on right now is unemployment benefits that we've seen a surge in 2020, just in terms of unemployment frauds and, and different things that are going on with that. And the other one is child identity theft. And so what we'd like to do, and hopefully we're able to get the video to play, but I just wanna play this uh, a short uh, two minute video, just to talk to you about in terms of child identity theft who is already bankrupt or a 16-year-old in debt for houses and cars, thieves have a new target. And we learned tonight that one in 10 American children is the victim of identity theft. One in 10. And as ABC's Pierre Thomas tells us, it can be years before parents realize it. Olivia McNamara was starting her freshman year at Vanderbilt University and, like so many 18-year-olds, applying for her first credit card. That's when the nightmare started. Olivia's credit applications were rejected twice. Someone had stolen her identity when she was nine years old. They had years to run up $1.5 million in debt. I can't even describe it. It's just really shocking and we just had no idea. The thieves created more than 42 accounts, defaulting on all of them. They took loans out on boats and houses and everything. Olivia's still working to clear her credit. It may take her months, if not years, to start fresh. A new report estimates that a staggering 1 in 10 American children are victims with no clue it's happening. Criminals hack home computers looking for tax forms with the Social Security numbers of children. They've also stolen identities from hospitals, child welfare agencies, even schools. We see children who have had this crime begin at as early as age, you know, five months old and then it goes on for years. Thieves stole 11-year-old Brianna's social security number and ran up more than $132,000 in debt, buying a car and a house. Using eight-year-old Bradley's ID, crooks took out two student loans and got five credit cards. Total damage, $19,200. The problem is large and growing. Um, and part of the problem is it's generally undetected and undetectable. Undetected because thieves use false names and addresses repeatedly, simply opening new accounts after they default. So what can parents do to protect their children? The most important thing, tell your children never to give out their social security number without your permission and make sure you check your child's credit periodically, no matter how young. I'm just happy that we caught it when I was 18 and not when I'm 22 and trying to get my own apartment. Pierre Thomas, ABC News, Washington. 
And so, I don't know about you guys, but it's a situation where when I send a now six-year-old uh, child to school, I don't check his his identity. It's not, it's not something that we really think about, like, hey, maybe I should check your identity. We think we worry about his lunch. We worry about uh, making sure he gets to school in time, all those different things. And this is the type of identity theft that you know, just scares me the most in regards to everything that's going on there. And so let's talk about the different types of policies. So we talked about all the different things and, and the, the things that, and the threats of identity, but let's talk about the different policies that are in place in terms of identity. So where we at least understand uh, what we either have or we uh, are trying to get, right? Uh, so there's three types of policies basic policies. The first policy is the reimbursement policies, right? And with a reimbursement policy simply means that they will give you money in regards to the identity theft situation, which is great if it's a financial identity theft situation, uh, getting back your money, that, that, that's a big thing in regards to that. Uh, the uh, second type of policy is what we call a resolution policy. And a resolution policy is just simply where the fraud investigators or the individuals that are monitoring your identity tell you that there's a alert and they tell you how to fix it. Now, I barely have time during a normal work week uh, to just do all the different things that I have to do. So I can't imagine also trying to fix my identity while managing all these different things that I have to do during the, those nine to five business hours. Because most of us work during those nine to five business hours, guess what? Uh, the credit bureaus and all the different organizations that we have to contact, they're open from nine to five. So that's a resolution policy where they tell you how to fix it and, they go ahead, and you go ahead and do it. With a restoration policy, uh, what happens is that they, the fraud investigators or the individuals actually take control of it and they fix it on your behalf. And so those are the three different types of policies. So you wanna know which policy you have. So maybe you have some sort of fraud investigation, you have some sort of stuff in place, but make sure you know what you have. So I'm gonna to talk to you about what ID Shield product does and how that works. So just to give you an idea of that. So one of the things that the ID Shield product does, it does monitor on this. And so we'll monitor as much information as you're comfortable having us monitor. And in some cases, we'll monitor more information than you thought that you needed to monitor. Like, I didn't even think about uh, 401k accounts or monitoring those different things. But those are different things that they realize as, as, as fraud investigators, that identity thieves are targeted. Uh, so you want to make sure that w you monitor the full gamut in regards to the different things and making sure that you're aware of that. The second thing that's going to happen is just, um, so next slide, please is just the, the having some sort of uh, you know, password protection program or having something in place where it monitors or codes the information and, and protects against that. So we have those things that, that do that because we want to make sure that uh, we're protecting the privacy information protecting. So it's not only identity, but also protecting your privacy and making sure those things are in place. And so uh, the next slide, please, is that we want to uh, make sure that uh, you have the privacy and the uh, reputation management in place. So we'll monitor like, the, uh, what is your Facebook saying about you? What are these different organizations saying about you? Uh, so we do those things as well. To me, the, the, the most important part of our product is the, uh, is the next uh, service that we actually offer, which is the restoration, right? And so what we'll do is we'll do, we'll do uh, million dollar service uh, guarantee where uh, if you have lost wages or you have to travel, you have to do different things, uh, we'll give you up to a million dollars in, in, in income um, for lost wages and those different things. But what they also do is they do restoration. That simply means that they'll go in there and restore your identity back to pre theft status. Uh, so we had a member that ha actually had a situation where she was in the process of delivering her first child. She knew it was her first child but the medical records when she was doing her doctor's visits reflected it was gonna be her second child. Apparently someone had used her medical information, had a child in her name, and she didn't know anything about it. And so she just felt they're so distraught, taken advantage of, how could this happen to me? I never thought anything like this would ever happen to me. And it's a situation where she didn't know if the ID Shield product would actually help, but she said, listen, I have it, uh, through my employer, why not use it? And so she was able to use it and they were able to restore her identity back to the pre-step status. So they did all the proactive research and everything else. 
And at that moment in time, she just had that peace of mind, knowing that she, if anything was to happen, that, well, one, this, this situation was, was taken care of, but anything was to happen in the future, that she will be um, taken care of as well. And so that's the thing with the ID Shield, you're able to have those things in place. Now we do different uh, discounts and uh, as a program. So you have like different discounts that we'll give. So we'll give discounts to all these different um, organizations uh, and those things. It's not the major things that uh, people get our service for, uh, but it's a pretty good book, you know? And people always ask me, Delano, do you know all uh, 500 different discounts? And the answer is no. I just tell people, tap into the app, look at the discounts. If you get a discount, pretty awesome. Uh, if you don't see the discount you're looking for, wait a little bit. We, we may add a couple other discounts, but those are the things in regards to that aspect of it. And so, um, next slide, please. It's just, we, oh, so this slide here is to remind me uh, that I'm supposed to do this elaborate sales presentation. So warning, elaborate sales presentation. Uh, so here it is, right? If you think that this is, is, see a benefit in terms of protecting your family or no other individuals that protect their family in regards mm -hmm. to identity theft, get access to it. If you don't, then don't get access to it. But yeah, that's my that's my level of elaborate sales presentation. And as I said, uh, this is the employer rates, uh, uh, so you could get the ID Shield through these different rates in regards to that. And so that's the uh, information in terms of the identity theft protection. And it's to me is this: if you 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 could get one of these services, you could get all of these services, you get you know any combination of the services that we uh, Justin, uh, Bill, and I talked about. But if you really want to be on the forefront of identity theft and cybersecurity and everything that's going on, getting all three of them together means that you're addressing the problem. You're actually going after the problem, and so that's my uh, I didn't. That's my portion of this whole uh, presentation. It's just a pleasure to uh, be able to work with these individuals and and communicate with them on almost a weekly basis. And so I'll open it up now for any questions or anything that. Uh, happened in the chat, so we could address. So don't forget, everybody, if you have a question, just throw it right in the chat for our guests. I, I do have a question for Justin. Um, so with everything that is kind of like how things are evolving with things like ransomware and other like other tactics that like phishing. Like, what do you recommend you know, organizations do to uh, as far as training? Like, like you know, what what kind of steps do you recommend? Do you recommend they they take? I'll, I'll throw that in the chat for you. Good question. Um, so what should business owners do? Um, find and use cyber awareness education, uh, make it a requirement, a condition uh, of employment on a yearly basis, uh, ensure the employees enroll and take it and have a passing grade uh, on a yearly basis because the threat actors and the threat landscape continue to change and you need to stay on top of it to reduce the likelihood of of a successful data breach or hack. Yeah, and just to add, um, the identity protection is a good way to just offer to employees uh, that type of uh, protection. Uh, normally we do it as a payroll deduction. 
So uh, as a voluntary benefit, so it's just a small amount that comes out the employee's check on mm -hmm. a, either bi-weekly or weekly basis to just how you have your payroll um, set up. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good way of just doing it. So also taking care of the macro, but also taking care of the micro, the individuals that handle our everyday uh, things that we go through. We have a question here in the chat from Cindy. Do you know the cost of WorkWise? The, uh, the content is updated on a yearly basis um, and it allows whoever's administering it to monitor employees that register and their completion and their, their numeric score that they're given. Dollars per user per year. If there's a large organization, association, a business, uh, you know, 100 licenses or more, there, there'd be a volume discount we could offer. Less than the $25 per user per year. Okay, are there any more questions for our presenters? No? All right, well, I wanna take this time to thank Justin Golden, Bill Becker, and Delano Paul for coming out today and presenting this great information about cybersecurity. Uh, don't forget, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So again, thank you gentlemen for coming and presenting, to, presenting all this information to us. We appreciate it and have a great day. One of the things is this, that there's so much things that's going on in the news and the good thing about, um, especially if you offer it as a, a employee benefit, uh, we cover both pre-existing as well as um, situations as well as you know, future situations. So you don't have to worry about that aspect. And so with the ID Shield, just having the monitoring, knowing what's going on um, and having those things in place, getting the alerts, then you could actually address it and have the fraud investigators do it versus years later, finding out about the situation that, that went on and now is a situation where it's just spiraled and just went into a bunch of things. So, you know, great question. Bill, there's a question for you. What does a business need to do now to get out in front of the new Connecticut cybersecurity law that went into effect on October 1st? And what, what do you think it will have on small businesses? So what I feel is, ha is going to, what businesses are going to need to do is, you know, first off to identify what type of data that you're interacting with. So that means like going through like the, any storage that you're, that you're housing it in, uh, communications that you're having back and forth and, classifying it as, hey, okay, so this is public data. So this is, if something were to happen, then if that was exposed, it's not that big of a deal. So public data, I mean like a flyer or some sort of event that you're promoting. Then you have stuff like internal, like an internal classification. So that's own information that only you and your employees will have access to. And then you have sensitive data, which is, is going to be very uh, limited and the most protected stuff so like social security, uh, credit card information, payment information, things of that nature. So you want to like inventory, like, every, like the first step is to like inventory everything. So your, like the hardware that you have, the software that you have running on the hardware or services, is, you know, services that you uh, use, whether it's uh, something that uh, license that you purchased and it's stalled on site or if you're using something in the cloud. So it's kind of like breaking down uh, things down by inventory and running policies uh, and procedures to uh, un un 
to make sure that things are functioning correctly. So as an example, do you have a backup? How often are you running a backup? What is, you know, how long is it going to take to restore a backup of say like five gigs or more? Because you want to make sure that you have things up and running rather quickly. And when it comes to the effect on small businesses, there's, there is going to be some sort of like budgetary constraints. So there is, there is software out there that is like, um, that you can software and tools that are, are, are budget friendly for your organization. Um, so for example, in, in the past I've worked with tools that, you know, cost like a hundred thousand dollars a year for a license where you know, one tool uh, that can do something similar is you know maybe three hundred dollars a year per license, so it's a, it's a matter of the, looking for those resources like and, and you know talking to different vendors to see what is going to work within your budget to uh, get your uh, get your security measures in place that uh, you can you know that you have some breathing room for, for your budget. Okay, Bill, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I know that uh, one one thing came through, um, through email about the uh, chamber perks and that's going on this month and what we uh, had planned for that. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Justin. Yeah, um, Bill Becker from Beat Squared Intel, myself from Golden Technology Services and Delano from ID Legal Shield. We're offering a ch member chamber perk and it's a... Um, three offerings rolled into one, or you can do an a la carte. We recommend all three, but all of them are available now. Um, it's on the Chamber website, and um, you can click on the link and, and enroll in that. Uh, we're gonna extend the, uh, the date. It was gonna expire at the end of this month since October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but due to the interest we've had and the fact that the Chamber's been supportive of our efforts, we're gonna extend that to November 15th. So you can take advantage to the end of November 15th. Any questions, feel free to give Delano, Bill, or I either a call or send us an email or text message and we'll respond right back to you. If there are no other questions, again, thank you to Lynn and the Chamber for sponsoring us today. And I hope this was educational and uh, you have a couple of takeaways you, you uh, will have with you. And uh, again, thank you for your time and, and attention. We'll have the slide decks available uh, uh, online and as well as we can send it to you uh, individually. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you again for coming out and presenting this for us. I hope you all found this to be very educational and beneficial to your business. Everyone have a nice day and take care.